thank you so much. I'm going to be your next speaker. Um, you guys see me? I don't see any of you. Hopefully, you can see me well. Uh, please show my slides. And uh, by, by the way, have you noticed no, nobody is stepping on this carpet? What happens if I do? It's like so soft, I'll just... Okay, so um, this is the largest title of a talk we could come up with to test the conference website. Joke. Um, essentially, you know, like you open up the conference uh, program to check your talk, usually a day before you s your talk. And then you figure out, oh, what did, did I submit half a year ago? Oh my goodness. And this is the title I found, uh, I submitted. And, uh, well, we usually spend two days um, talking about this uh, subject with my uh, partner in crime, Roland Flam, and today I thought I had 15 minutes, but then actually I thought I learned I have only 30 minutes. So let's try to simplify this title. Okay, so this is a shorter version of the talk uh, and of the title too, strate Strategic Org Design. And uh, essentially with org topologies. So you all will be learning a little bit of org topologies during this remaining 29 minutes and 11 seconds that, that I got. Okay, so hopefully you all are interested in understanding what org design is and how to improve structures of organizations. And why? Because that might give you adaptability, innovation, and resilience. It might help you to create better organizations. Okay, so this is the talk we're gonna spend 29 minutes talking about. And yeah, uh, here I am at the ACE conference. My partner, Ron Flam, is at home in Utrecht, in a wonderful city in the Netherlands, and I'm here speaking alone today. Right, so you guys see this pirate, right, um, who is trying to navigate the the complexity, and I found this nice flag, find your way beyond frameworks. So the idea of the conference is go beyond frameworks, right, and, uh, but like, how? Frameworks actually help you to, well, maybe they are wrong targets, right? But they help you to know where to go to. And now without frameworks, now that we ditch all the frameworks, how do we navigate? Right, so this is exactly the metaphor we're using. And Octopologist uh, is this map to help you to navigate in this, complex, in this complexity of frameworks and also uh, beyond the frameworks. Uh, Paul Hedges said they I kick-started the conference somehow. Actually, this is you speaking in Kiev. It took me a while to figure this out. There's a video on Vimeo.com 13 years ago in a very bad quality because back in those days, children, there was no good connection, you know? Um, so it was a long time ago, right? And so we're all old people here, and I just read this article is that Gen Z, right, this new generation Z, they're currently entering the labor market these days. And it got me thinking, wait a minute, most of the folks entering the market now, they're born after the Agile Manifesto was signed. So for you, it's like, for most of you, right, it's like prehistorical ages, Agile Manifesto. Interesting, no? So I think it's a nice breakout to, to speak about death now. So, uh, you know, born in death and reborn, and there's been discussions like if Agile is dead or it just smells bad or something, you know? Um, and, and, and this is something I'd like to explore today with you. Or has Agile failed? Maybe that's a better way to frame it. And I'm going to give you different answers to this question, right? Because it's not so trivial. Is it dead or is it not dead? But, like, let's remember what we were promised. It doesn't take you more than one minute to ask your chat GPT bot what are the benefits that Agile or, uh, is giving to organization. And you get into this nice list of 10 items that everybody would say, yes, I want this, I, was, I want flexibility, I want customer collaboration, I, I want enhancement and productivity, I want, I want all of it. So Agile is this great pitch, everybody wants it, but then something kind of went wrong over the last 10, 20 years, and not so many companies actually get that. Right? Interestingly. So, what went wrong? Um, yeah, so we at Org Topologists are trying to understand how we can improve that. Going beyond Agile Dead or not Dead. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. So, Agile Dead or not, it's just, you know, a clickbait. What's really interesting is like, how can we help organizations improve? And we found this massive, massive, a body of knowledge 
called Org Design. Two interesting things about this bookshelf for people who can pay attention, right? Two interesting things. Lots of these books have design in the title, right? Designing organization, designing dynamic organization, designing your organization, designing customer-centric organization, designing like, a lot of designing. How much about designing we talk when we do agile transformations? Not so much. Another interesting thing about this bookshelf is that anybody has noticed already? It's written by the same guy. Okay, so this is J.R. Galbraith. And if Agile Manifesto was long ago, check this one out, you know? <laughs> this comes from 60s, the star model, uh, even like before the pre prehistorical era, right? But like the, the, you don't need to read all those books, right? But like the essence of his research and his method was he said, listen, strategy or what an organization wants to do and the previous speaker spent quite some good time talking about like, what actually org organization wants and needs. It's an input. It's a, an input to design your organization. And based on the input, you can derive org design criteria, and I'm going to talk about them later. And then you can change or create different things. Structure, processes, rewards, and people. These are these four things Dr. Galbraith identified that need to be in alignment. So the key idea is that these elements, structure, processes, reward, people, criteria, they form a system. They need to be in alignment, right? You cannot just go and optimize just one of them because you will not likely to get the outcome. Make sense so far? Yeah? Yeah, cool. I just, I cannot see you at all, so I'm, I, I, at least I hear you guys. So, and what the Agile community has been focusing on? We focus a lot, I think, on performance and culture. We run cultural programs. We try to optimize performance. We measure velocity, hopefully not so much anymore. But we focus on the outcomes, and we try to change the outcomes. But you cannot change the outcomes without changing the system, right? Another maybe painful question, which of these elements we spend the most time working on? Structure, processes, rewards, people? I've been a Scrum Master for many years, Agile coach for many years, consultant. I'm guilty, you know, as many of you, spent a lot of time trying to fix processes. But it doesn't work if the structure is not right. So this, actually, this lesson is now 70 years old or 50 years old or something, but it's still very much relevant till today, right? This element needs to be in alignment. This is a um, similar talk done by our uh, colleague and partner, Jürgen Desmet, last year at, last week actually, in Ghent at a regional Scrum gathering. And he has this example, right, of this misalignment. He says, well, maybe the company wants product innovation as a strategy. Great, and structurally what it does, it creates a matrix organization with functions and projects, okay? Hmm, not really innovative. And then processes, they put Scrum on top, right? Is it gonna work? Mm, not likely, and looking at the rewards, they still reward for you know, job-based payments, they reward for people staying longer in the position, and they're rewarding for people and they're hiring people who are likely to stay single-skilled specialists. So this is an example of a system which is not really aligned. And no matter how many Scrum Masters you hire into this company, if you don't change other elements, it's going to be a disaster. That's maybe why Paul said today, this year, you said, right, there are no more Scrum Master jobs in Krakow or something. It's not a surprise because those people actually are disappointed because we promised something and it didn't happen. So no surprise, right, because we spent so much time working on processes. Our, this is a newer version of a star model done by Karim Harbert, like an updated, refreshed version a few years ago. Great book, enablers, six, en six Enablers of Business Agility. He actually identifies much more of these elements, like or culture, structure, people engagement, governance, finding ways of working, and leadership. So much more than just, just four, but essentially the same idea. These elements need to be in alignment. Question to you, like, if you decide just to pick one of them, 
It's not systemic, not recommended, but what if you can change only one of these elements? Which one you think will generate bigger impact? Just think for this for 20 seconds while I'm drinking my tea. We all might have different ideas, right? And we don't have time to argue. I think this one. You know, like if you really can change how the company makes decision on budgeting, and if you can de-associate scoping from budgeting, if budgeting just becomes, okay, how, many, how much money we need to reserve next year for our R&D? Okay, 10 million, fine. Let them figure out to what to do. If you can de-associate scoping from budgeting, this could be already a big change. Or maybe you start doing more frequent budgeting, not just once a year, but often. So I think this one is interesting, but just for a thought experiment, right? And if you're going to do this, you, you can find this body of knowledge beyond budgeting by beyond the boxness, right? There are great ways and methods how you would implement that. So it's just an example for you, right? Like if you're going into one area, you should probably find and dig up some interesting stuff. So Imagine you are implementing something radical, like beyond budgeting. What would you need from your management? This is actually the question we're asking ourselves. How to make change systemic? What, we, what would you need from management? Support? Trust? Good luck to you with that one. Like, it's, not, it's great to have it, but it's not going to happen if you don't have it, right? It takes years to build trust. and we do not have a really good track record <laughs> somehow in the Agile community. So today we had a keynote, right? And she said quite nicely that we need support from executive leaders. And I can only double click on that. But is support enough? Do we just need the blessing and to do our thing or do we need something more? So at Octopologies, we build this community of people who actually apply Octopologies. And I know I haven't yet explained what Octopologies is, but there are people who actually know and they practice. We call them champions and educators. And quote from Steve Alexander, he says, this is his approach to change. He's coming to an, a leader and, and saying, are you satisfied with how things are going? And the other, if, and if the answer says yes, no engagement. If the answer is, yeah, no, not really, we're not really happy, the next question of Steve is, well, is your org design fit for purpose? Are you set up in a way that matches what you want to achieve? And the leader typically says, I don't know. And the Steve says, OK, let's see um, how to do this. Right? So we're trying to invite leaders and managers into the field of org design, because it's not really a subject which is being taught a lot. I try to do an MBA. Don't recommend anybody to do an MBA. But I, I tried an MBA for just a year out of two. Uh, the topic of org design been mentioned like twice, and it was executive MBA. So it's, this is not a topic managers actually spend time thinking, although everybody actually influences org design. Who of you influences org design? Actually, I see like five hands, but I think everybody. Like if you're hiring somebody and you're deciding which team he or she is joining, this is an org design decision. If you're talking to somebody one-on-one -on -one and the guy or, or girl decides to, to learn something, this is an org design decision because learning something might expand some, some options this team, this individual is, can do. So everybody of us is doing org design but not really thoughtful somehow. Quote uh, from my mentor, Craig Larman, uh, author of Large Scale Scrum, and he says, if you call it a process change, you will get managers' support, which is not bad. But if you call it org design change, you'll get their involvement. Because good managers know org design is their thing. They will not delegate it to consultants, you know, to scrum masters. It's their job. They need to do it with people and for the people. That's why I think org design needs to be made more interesting and accessible for uh, people, right? And uh, to double click on this involvement, right? And double click on the previous points. So there's this book, which is pretty fresh. That's maybe the freshest book on org design by Nikolai Warren, a professor from Norway. This book is called Organizational Design. And he says the following, right? For the successful execution of an organizational strategy, 
it is essential that its structure and operating model are aligned with strategic goals and work processes. So, and he calls this term strate strategic alignment. Alignment between the what we want to achieve, strategy, and how we're doing things. Structure and operating model. It's a super simple idea, right? It's the, the same one from a star model five slides above, but if the things are not aligned, not, nothing will work, not agile. And actually, I'm not sure if Kanban still around or Kanban is also dead. Paul, I don't know these days. I don't hear much about Kanban. But in Kanban, right now, David J. Anderson, he has a book called Fit for Purpose, which is a similar idea, right? How to create organizations which are fit for what they are up to. Great idea. Do we agile people, and I'm calling myself an agile, an agile person, do we have a name for this concept at all? If we come and, try to, and we try to implement Scrum, it doesn't work because that, that there are no good teams. How do you call it? Do you call it fit for purpose? Hmm. We don't even have a term for this. I think this is the, shows the problem, right? Maybe we call it an impediment. And who read Scrum Guides? five times before lunch today. Like, who, who removes Im impediments in Scrum? Scrum Master, right? Scrum Master in charge of org design? Not in many cases, right? So actually, it's no surprise, again, that Agile is failing or that, or maybe something else, like another answer, right? But we, it's not too late, right? It's maybe dying, but it's not that. It's not too late. Well, this is us, me, and my partner, Roland Flam. And this is not, not, not just to show our beautiful AI faces, it's just to show that we call ourselves org consultants, although five years ago we would call ourselves agile coaches. And org consultant is this stance, which is very different to agile coaching, and I will explain. But we would call ourselves recovering agile coaches. We failed many organizations to deliver on the promises, and coming with an org de designer hat actually introduces a very interesting um, dynamics. So we are on a mission to make org design great again. When people think of org design, typically they have in their imagination these very boring black and white pictures, right? It doesn't need to be this way. When we think of org design, we see people collaborating, maybe not the best photo to recognize people there, but like for us, org design is the creation of this environment where people can do freely what they need to do. You know, um, self-management, maybe one, one of the things you might want to create, or cross-team cross learning, or coordination, or something else, but this is about people. And our mission is to make org design accessible. Every, everybody would say, yeah, it's nice to have this environment where the teams can flourish and, and people can talk to each other and you can do multi-team backlog refinement sessions and whatnot, how to do it. And org topologies is this map that we have not really created but discovered that I believe is just one answer to how to start having this discussion with management on what is an org design? So we teach this in a bunch of classes. It's a, it's a long topic, it's a two-day class, and we're gonna have a class in Warsaw in December. Uh, no more ads allowed in the stock. And we have more, a few more things coming up in Prague and Vienna. Learn about org, de, org de, de, de design. It doesn't need to be from me or octopologies. Just explore, explore the domain of org design and we'll be happy to hear your stories. What we help people to do in these classes. That's not an app, this is just more explanation what org design as an activity is. Is where people analyze how the organization currently structured and they draw these very chaotic, formless diagrams which help them to understand how the company is actually organized. Essentially, we take company strategy, we analyze what the company's value proposition is, who are the customers, like what the company is meant to be doing, what's the expected impact. And then we're trying to draw a diagram and understand how the company is inside, structured or designed, what's its operating model, and we use octopologies for that, and it helps to identify the cracks, the unfit, the misalignment, right, between the strategy and the structure. So the goal is to find these misconcep misconceptions or mis uh, mis uh, um, misconsistencies, right? In inconsistencies between strategy and org design. So a few words, I have 10 minutes left, and I haven't explained it yet. So what is org topologies? 
So this is like the chemical table of elements, not created but discovered, has two axes. One axis is scope of capabilities, horizontal axis. Everybody can understand scope of capabilities. That's where we go from single individuals working in isolation to functional groups, to functional, cross-functional teams, but not really complete, to end-to-end -to -end fast flow teams. We think these four categories on horizontal axis described quite a lot of different archetypes that you see in your organization. So you can think about any employee in your company or any team or any group of people, and you should be able to classify them, whether it's single skill in individual functional group, cross-functional, or super fast team. This is the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is scope of work. Yes, they can be as fast as, as they are based on this fourth step. They may be end-to-end -end teams, but what's the work they're working on? Are they given tasks or features or customer problems or business problems? Depending on this level of verticalness on the map, you can also discuss which team uh, I'm currently dealing with. So these two dimensions give you 16 different boxes or archetypes, which is enough we discovered over the years to describe quite in a good details any organizational ecosystem. The skips, these six skips, where are the skips on the map? This is the space between the boxes. That's where the magic happens. To go from one box to another, somebody in the company needs to understand something. Some, some realization might, might occur to them, like maybe crossing this red line from siloed functional groups to incomplete multi-team groups. Real, real, the realization is, oh my god, if we can put functional people together, they can actually talk to each other without manager, and they can actually self-manage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a very simplified version of the map is just two by two. It's either a resource optimization or flow optimization. And you can think what, you, what your company is optimizing for. Uh, business of people, a resource of optimization, or getting things faster to the clients. And then, is it about output or outcome? And we talk a lot about outcome versus output in the Agile community, but this is the map where you would say, hey, this team is just maybe an iOS team. It's a great fast flow team, but actually iOS app is not a product. It's just a bunch of features, right? So you'll be able to classify your teams based on the map. And then a very simplified version of the map with the four quadrants. You have narrowly specializing work units, you have the Agile teams here, interestingly. You have a speculative departments, which sends specs, speculations uh, to the workers. And you have highly adaptive organizations. That's the most interesting part for me. And we spent a lot of time in Octopologies, first of all, develop this whole map, but also look at how you create a highly adaptive organization, because this is just super interesting for us. And uh, where? Does Agile transformation fit? In most cases, just here. We went from narrowly specializing individuals to making the Agile or Scrum teams, but we didn't really create enough space for high adaptability and cross-team cross learning. That's why Agile is failing, or dead, or whatever, because it's been diminished to mean just building teams. And what's wrong with Agile teams? We call it the first wave of Agile. We say Agile is not dead, but it's just, we just implemented the first wave. We just need to keep doing that, but actually broader and go up on the map. So we created cross-functional units. Hey, great. And now we have faster flow, but locally. You can have 20 teams, which are super fast. Fantastic, but does the whole company, is the whole company actually faster? And this typically called uh, copy-paste Scrum in the industry where you apply Scrum not to the product, as it was meant to be by two individual teams. And now you have 20 different backlogs, each per, each per team. This is a not systemic org change. You had just more silos now. Maybe Scrum teams are better silos than functional groups, maybe, but still silos. And teams are fast, but the work is still slow. So this is the problem, right? And the this upper right corner, which we call 
high-level archetypes. This is space for rich collaboration, where many teams can share work with each other. They have maybe one backlog in Scrum terms. They have one product definition for many teams. They work together on something bigger, and they can teach each other, help each other, mope with each other, right? Uh, all these nice ideas of multi-learning. And actually, you have a simpler organization if you're going that way. So that way is actually the journey of descaling your organization, interestingly, because essentially you will remove all the wastes, all the managers who just coordinate people because people can now know better things. There will be talks about OKR today, tomorrow. OKR, if done right, can be a great idea to achieve that. And you need, you'll need much less people if you're working in that organization. There's, there've, been, there's been studies where if you go from, let's say, low-level archetypes, component teams, you might need hundreds of component teams. If you go to real, super cross-functional, cross-component teams, you just need maybe one or two. So you need much less people if you're able to create those interesting org design. But also, it's hard to create that because middle managers will not like that. Uh, it's hard to create and hard to sustain because organizational entropy will try to rip apart that specific department where it's so be be beautiful. I have so many things to tell you. I have only four minutes left, so I need to pick the right things to tell you now. Maybe one thing. Um, what's, the, what's the difference between an agile coach and an org designer? I, I said we call ourselves recovering agile coaches, right? And we stop calling ourselves agile coaches. Why? What's the, the difference? I think this is the an agile coach uh, from day to day basis. Uh, why there's so much change in mood? What, do they, what makes them happy? What makes an agile coach or a scrum master happy? Nothing. If Agile is done right, they're happy, right? So, so they are super much anchored and biased with, with Agile. If the team done daily stand-up today, yeah, it's a point of a celebration. If tomorrow they forgot, ooh. Org designers are like that. Uh, I showed the slide to my friend, and he, he, he said he's a bit grumpy. So I fixed that a little bit. This is an org designer, right? He's happy. Uh, but not too happy, because he doesn't care about Agile or not Agile. The only thing org designer cares about is, so what do you really need as an organization? And, you know, if you say you want it, create it. If you want great Scrum, well, create environment for that. If you want something else, do something else, but be really clear to yourself. Right, so this is the only thing that makes org designer happy is when the company does what it says it needs to do. And I have two minutes left, and uh, what you can do with org topologies, really briefly, right? You can say, well, if you want really traditional, busy, optimizing organization, you need these archetypes. If you need to create a feature flow of feature factory, Sounds bad, but org designer, he's neutral. If you want feature factory, this will be the idea how to create a feature factory. If you want to improve short, if you want to improve lead times on business goals, you would probably need these archetypes. If you want to create business agility, you will need these archetypes. I know I'm going super fast. I'm going to share the slides, and I apologize for doing that so fast. Uh, so essentially, org designer discusses system optimizing goal with the management. So what do you want? What do you want to optimize for? Innovation or lead times or something else or something else or something else. And based on this, or the designer helps to structure and come up with an org design that fits that. And octopologist can be just one way of doing that. So has Agile failed? I think we've failed Agile because we didn't really pay enough time uh, to a lot of really important things, like, like org structure. And another answer is Agile is Agile that? Well, not necessarily. And it will depend on your org design. Uh, and with org design, you can either make it super great or disastrous, right? And uh, so it all depends on what you're building in your organization and how thoughtful you are in this. A call to action here, uh, please. It's a QR code. You can 
Thank you. Thank you, Google. My time is up. I'm going to wrap up. So please use this QR code if you want, and you can download the primer with a lot of maps, a lot of explanations, much better written than I'm currently trying to give you in 30 minutes. There's a vast body of knowledge that we're trying to collect and give for free because our goal is to make org design sexy and accessible for everybody. Thanks a lot.